OCI. As uh, most of you know by now, uh, about a year ago, uh, OCI became the new home to uh, the new home to to, to Grails. So uh, about a year ago, we got we got started with the practice at OCI, and at that point, there were two of us uh, on the team, and that was uh, that was Graham and myself. And in the first year of having the practice at OCI, we've uh, grown the team from the two of us to uh, uh, 12 of us currently on the team, and, uh, and we're hiring. So if you're interested in doing Grails work, uh, send us a note at grailsjob at ociweb.com, grailsjobs at ociweb.com. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, we moved the practice to Grails, uh, as we said, about a year ago, and uh, things are going um, just fantastically well. In the first year, as I said, we've grown the team substantially. We're still growing the team. Uh, in the first year, we released uh, something like 25 releases, which has been fantastic. Uh, we made a conscious decision with, uh, with Grails 3 to, to release Grails 3.0 on uh, March 31st of last year. And we made a conscious decision with Grails 3 to start releasing smaller, more frequent releases. And there are a number of benefits uh, to that approach. And uh, one is it's, uh, we can get features and bug fixes to users more quickly. So if one of us uh, makes an improvement to Grails today, uh, you'll probably see that in a release uh, in a small number of weeks, maybe three weeks away or something like that, not months away, which is great. And uh, another nice uh, side effect of that approach, uh, of course, is that it makes the releases smaller and more manageable. It's much more easy for you to upgrade your application uh, the day before yesterday, um, we released Grails 3.1.8. So if you were on Grails 3.1.7, the update to Grails 3.1.8 is very small and simple. You could do that uh, probably, it, it wouldn't take you very much time at all to do that upgrade. And if you're consistently doing that, uh, you never get to a point where an upgrade is a big major effort. So the smaller, more frequent releases uh, has, uh, has worked out very, very well. We've gotten really great feedback from the community about that. Uh, so we'll continue doing that. Um, and uh, one of the things that's enabling us to do that is we've got, we've got the full support of, uh, of the company behind the scenes. We're actively moving the technology forward. And it's, uh, it's really great to be at an organization that, that really, truly supports us and uh, is helping us get where we want to be in the framework. Um, and it's been a long time since we've been operating in that mode. Uh, so I, I couldn't be happier about how, how well things are going at OCI. So the, the practice, uh, at the, the Grails practice includes not only supporting the technology, uh, developing the technology, but also uh, we offer professional services around the technology. That includes Grails 3 training. Uh, we're helping a lot of clients do uh, Grails upgrades. So if you've got Grails 2, a Grails 2 project that you want to update to Grails 3, we'd love to talk to you about that and help you, uh, help you with that uh, however we can. And we also do a lot of project work. Um, so for any help with professional services around, around the framework, uh, please reach out to us and let us know, and uh, we'd be happy to talk to you and uh, help you get uh, your application to where we want to be. Uh, just a little bit more about OCI. So OCI has been in business for about 24 years, um, and it's been an open source company the entire time. Uh, so OCI was an open source company before it was cool to be an open source company. Uh, we've got 140-something engineers, and something like 30% of the team have PhDs and master's degrees in their field. Uh, so we've just got a super strong uh, team of, uh, of developers uh, at OCI. So um, anything at all that we can help you out with, uh, reach out and let me know. As I said, OCI has been an open source company the entire time for 24 years. Um, this is uh, uh, some of the open source technologies that, uh, that we support, and uh, Grails, of course, is, uh, uh, is where I spend all of my time at. This is a, a, a small subset of a lot of our, our customers, and, and really what I want to relay there is that uh, we're targeting many industries, right? And that works out really well for Grails. Grails is a, a general purpose framework. It's not a, a framework for building aerospace applications or a framework for building financial applications. It's a general purpose web framework, uh, which makes it appealing to anyone who wants to build web apps. And uh, of course, that's every industry. Um, so, so we work in uh, pretty much every industry. Things are going great at OCI. As I said before, I couldn't be happier about, uh, about the decision to, to bring the team there. And it's uh, working out very, very well. So what I want to talk about uh, today is uh, we're going to talk about monitoring and metrics with, uh, with Grails 3. And this, is a, this talk is going to be a, a, 
good bit different than uh, pretty much every other technical talk that, uh, that I deliver on a regular basis uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is that I, I want to demonstrate some capabilities that are, uh, are not complete. Uh, so uh, we're going to talk about the Drop Wizard metrics plugin that's being developed for Grails 3. And uh, not a whole lot of effort has gone into developing the thing yet. Uh, I'll demonstrate what, what the plugin is capable of now. Um, but one of the reasons that I, that I want to, to talk about this is to solicit feedback, put, put some of the ideas out there and start to get feedback from the community to uh, gather information about what sorts of things would help you get, uh, get what you need out of Grails 3 applications in terms of monitoring and metrics. Uh, so as I go through this, be thinking about uh, what pieces of this seem interesting and what would you like to be able to do that you cannot do today or are not sure how to do easily today with respect to monitoring and metrics. And all, all the feedback that uh, we can get around that will help us um, uh, evolve this thing to make it, uh, to make it more and more compelling. So uh, as I said, not a whole lot of effort has gone into this plugin yet, but already it's, it's capable of some pretty interesting things that I'll demonstrate. Um, so as I said, uh, one of the goals here is to get, some, get feedback and start the discussion with the community about what kinds of things we can do uh, in this area to, to help you out. And another is uh, to talk about uh, some, of the, some of the features that the plugin does support, or talking about some of the features that the plugin supports is going to enable me to talk about some really cool features that Grails 3 and, uh, and Groovy have to offer. And a lot of that has to do with AST transformations. Um, so, so there are some, some interesting pieces, in interesting things going on with this plugin that uh, should be of general interest to Grails 3 developers. And kind of along those same lines, I'm going to demonstrate some capabilities that are made really simple uh, in Grails 3 because of the fact that Grails 3 is built on top of Spring Boot. And that's an important point. It's an important thing for Grails developers to recognize is that Grails 3, Grails 3 was a, a major overhaul of the framework. And uh, we, we re-architected the whole thing to run on top of Spring Boot. So every Grails 3 <coughs> application is a Spring Boot application. There are no, no exceptions to that. So anything you can do in a Spring Boot application, you can do in a Grails 3 application, plus a whole bunch of other stuff, right? Everything else that Grails adds on top of that. So when folks are talking about, uh, should I use Grails or should I use Spring Boot? Uh, I think a good way to think about that is should I use Spring Boot alone or should I use Spring Boot with all this other cool stuff that Grails has to offer? Uh, that's really the way that, that I look at things. So I'll demonstrate a couple of features that are specifically coming from Spring Boot that relate to monitoring and, and management and so forth. Uh, and that'll demonstrate or support uh, that, uh, the point that I, that I just described and that is Grails 3 is built on top of Spring Boot and that's important. The reason that we decided to build Grails 3 on top of Spring Boot is Spring Boot is this really powerful, really flexible platform that offers all kinds of cool stuff that is enabling us to do even cooler things in, uh, in Grails 3. All right, um, so we're developing a plugin called the Drop Wizard Metrics plugin. So this is a Grails 3 plugin that uh, kind of sits between your application and the Drop Wizard Metrics library. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what the library is capable of. Uh, we're not going to get into uh, super low-level details about Drop Wizard, but I'm going to introduce a couple of capabilities that the library has to offer, and then take a look at what it looks like in a Grails 3 application to take advantage of some of those capabilities. And that will enable us to talk about some of the things I mentioned before, some Groovy features that uh, Grails takes advantage of to really help with the developer productivity gains that, uh, that, that Grails has to offer. So installing the plugin is super simple. Like, like any other Grails 3 plugin, in your build.gradle file, you have to express a dependency on the, on the plugin the same way you would express a dependency on any other jar library, right? So you can't tell from looking at that line of code there that this is a plugin other than the org name happens to be org.grails.plugins. But the, but the syntax for expressing a dependency on a plugin is exactly the same as the syntax for expressing a dependency on any other, uh, on any other kind of library in a Grails 3 application. Uh, so one of, the, one of the major things that, that changed in Grails 3, separate from this re-architecting the framework to sit on top of Spring Boot, is we removed our own build system that was part of Grails 2. In Grails 2, we had our own build system that was kind of built on top of, or at least took advantage of, a technology called Yamp, which is a, a tool for uh, enabling easy access to ants from Groovy, basically. 
little bit more than that, but, but basically it was that. And we built our own kind of, uh, our own build system on top of that. And it was sufficient for, uh, for building Rails applications and it supported us for a long time, but it really wasn't a full featured, well-rounded build system. It was a, a pretty narrow build system specifically written for Grails. One of the things we changed in Grails 3 is we got rid of all of that and uh, built our stuff on top of Gradle. So now you get to take advantage of all the great stuff that Gradle has to offer, and uh, here's an example of that, right? There's no special mechanism for installing a plugin. You're simply expressing a dependency on a library the same way you would, you would express any dependency with Gradle. So that's good. So the plugin is called Drop Wizard Metrics. Uh, you see I'm using a, a build snapshot. As I said, this is still uh, early in development. Um, but that's what the dependency would look like if we were going to take advantage of, uh, of the plugin for this. So one of the ideas that uh, Drop Wizard supports is uh, Drop Wizard has the notion of a meter. Um, so one of the things I can do with a meter is measure the rate of events over time. There's some built-in support for um, tracking averages on uh, one and five and 15 minute uh, intervals. So if I've got a meter in my application, whatever it's metering, I can look at that meter and find out how many times has this thing happened uh, over the last uh, five minutes. Well, what's the average time for these things to happen um, over the last five minutes or 15 minutes? So that, that quote there, that's the description that Drop Wiz the Drop Wizard library itself uses to describe uh, their idea of a uh, meter. So we're measuring the rate of events over time, the, the quest for events. So in, uh, in a, a, a Grails 3 application that's using this plugin, one of the things you can do is you can write a class like this sum class um, that you see in the lower right there that implements meterable. So it looks like meterable must be an interface or might be an interface, but meterable is actually a trait, right? Groovy has, uh, has support for traits. A trait is like an interface and it's like a class, but it's really neither of those things. Um, a trait is like an interface in that uh, you implement it the same way you do here, but it's, it's like a class in that you can have real code inside of, the, um, inside of the methods that you declare in that interface. So you can define behavior in a trait, and then when a class implements that trait, all of the behavior that's defined in the trait is brought into this class. So it's, it's like inheritance, right? So if meterable were a class, and some class extends meterable, then some class would inherit all the behavior that was defined in meterable. But an important distinction between a trait and a class is uh, you can only extend one class, right? Just like in Java with Groovy, every class has one parent class. You can't extend two different classes, but you can implement any number of traits. So there's a meterable trait provided by the plugin, and what the meterable trait does is one of the things it does is it provides a method called mark meter. Uh, and the way to take advantage of that method is uh, you simply call mark meter and pass the name of the meter as an argument. So you're passing a string to the mark meter method. And what that does is it, uh, uh, it increments that meter, right? So you're keeping track of how often does this method get called? So the, one of the ways to take advantage of that feature is as simple as what you see here, right? If you've got a class that wants to meter something, that class can implement the meet meterable trait. And then inside the class, when you call mark meter and pass a string as an argument, that increments that meter. Right, so it could barely be simpler uh, to take advantage of the meter. We're going to look at another way to take advantage of the meter, but, uh, but that, uh, that's pretty straightforward and simple. That's an example of Grails um, uh, making it very, very simple to take advantage of, of frameworks like Drop Wizard. Uh, we don't have to mention Drop Wizard inside of the some class class. We don't have any tedious code that's going out to the Spring application context to get the metric registry. That's what's happening, but it's all happening inside of the uh, inside of the trait, right? So there's code inside of the meterable trait that handles all the complexity of, of going out to the, the Spring application context, getting the metric registry, finding this meter, incrementing the meter. All the stuff that has to happen is happening uh, by a code that's provided by that trait. So now the code that you're writing is made super duper simple, right? As you see here, and the unit test over there on the on the left um, demonstrates. Uh, testing this class, right? So notice that test is annotated with at test, uh, at test mix in, Grails unit test mix in. So I want this unit test not just to be a standard box stack. I want it to be a, a, a stack that is kind of Grails environment aware. And 
and that's what the Grail's unit definition does. And one of the things I can do as a result of that is I can define beams that get added to the application context that's used in these test results. So the beam that's being added there in the static Julia spring block is a beam called metric registry, and it's an instance of the metric registry class. Turns up, so that's a, a droplet bit class. And that registry is where all the meters and timers, it's, it's kind of the, it's the place where all the, all the droplet bit stuff lives. And the reason that I need one of those in the spring application context is the code that's inside the meterable tree, the way that it's doing what it's doing is, is it's going out to the spring application context, finding the registry, and then interacting with it, right? Going to the registry to get the meter. Um, uh, so, so the code in the meterable trait needs to be able to interact with the metric registry. So the metric registry needs to be in the spring application context. And the way that uh, Grails 3 unit testing stuff works, uh, it's super easy to add stuff to the spring application context. And that, that's what's represented in that Julia spring uh, code here. Uh, so then uh, what's happening here? So in, in the test, uh, we get a reference to the registry out of the spring application context, and then create an instance of some class, interact with it a few times, and then just make an assertion that the timer count is what we expect it to be. So we're, we're testing that the sum action method really is incrementing uh, that meter. In this case, we're, we're only making a, a claim about the count of times that the meter has been, been incremented. Um, in the real application, in the same example that's coming up, uh, you, can, uh, you can discover the counts, you can discover averages. There's more information that you can retrieve from that meter than what's demonstrated in this test. But I wanted to demonstrate how to, uh, when you're unit testing code that's using the meterable tree, uh, the example you see here is, is a good way to go about that. And the important part is that that metric registry has been added to the spring application context. If all that made sense? Questions about any of that? Great. Uh, so another way to take advantage of drop wizard metering is uh, with an annotation that the plugin provides. So the trait that I just talked about comes from the plugin. That's not from Drop Wizard. And this annotation also comes from the plugin. Um, so here we've got a class called some metered class, and it's got a property in it of type metric registry and a property in it of metric registry. And we've got a method that I want to meter. So if I were going to interact with Drop Wizard kind of directly, the code you see here is, is how I might do that. So I would register an instance of this class, the some metered class, as a beam in the spring application context and configure it to participate in dependency injection. So the metric registry property will be initialized by spring. So something's got to add that metric registry beam to the spring application context and that will enable uh, this class to get a reference to that uh, metric registry by way of spring dependency injection. So we've got a reference to a metric registry before this method executes. And what the method is doing is creating a, uh, creating a name for this meter, and there's some overloaded versions of the name method, but uh, we'll just say that the meter is called some meter. That's uh, good enough for, for our purposes here. Uh, so I've got a, a meter name, then I want to retrieve a meter from the metric registry by that name, and then I want to mark the meter, right? So all that stuff is happening automatically when you implement the meterable trait. Uh, this is what it would look, might look like if you weren't using the meterable trait. Um, but that demonstrates what's, what's really going on with the test code. If you annotate a method with at meter, which is, again, that's the an annotation that's provided by the plugin, you can do something like this, at metered, and then pass a meter name as an argument. And there are other optional attributes uh, that affect how the meter name is actually uh, created. But I can annotate a method with at meter, provide a meter name, and that's it. Uh, so there's no code here that makes mention of the metric registry. There's no code that talks about meters other than the meter annotation. And now the sum action method there will be metered the same way that the sum action method that you see on the left is metered. Right? So you don't have to write any of that code. It's all added by the, uh, by the plugin. And how it's added by the plugin is, uh, is, is interesting. So we're, we're able to rig all of that up at compile time. So the at metered annotation has an AST transformation associated with it. So Groovy supports AST transformations, and an AST transformation, in short, is uh, code that uh, you get to write that um, participates in uh, Groovy compilation. So you've annotated this method with at meter. That tells the Groovy compiler that when this method is uh, compiled, go execute.
execute the special ASP transformation that's associated with this annotation. And what that ASP transformation is doing is it's generating all the code that you see on the left, right? The ASP transformation is, is doing all the, the stuff that the code should go, gets a reference to the registry, gets a meter, increment the meter, all that's happening. Uh, all that code is being added to your class at compile time, but you don't see that code in the source code, uh, which is good. In general, code is a, is a liability, right? We want less code, not more code. And having this declarative approach, as opposed to writing imperative logic inside your, of your method, you're declaratively expressing that you want this particular method to be metered. And you don't have to know about the implementation details of how that works. Uh, you don't really have to understand how to interact with graph wizard. And if the implement implementation changes in the future for some reason, your code stays exactly the same, right? You've written the code that it, uh, annotates a method with that meter, and the stuff that's in the background there on the left is all generated for your compile time. So if in some future version of, uh, of the plugin, that code that's in the background changes, you know, fundamentally different things have to happen there, that doesn't affect your code. So we're, we're able to do that sort of thing uh, because of Groovy's ASP transformation. And that same approach is used all over the place in the Grails framework. We apply ASP transformations to all of your artifacts, so domain classes have transformations applied to them, services, tagless, uh, controllers, quirk jobs, uh, lots of things in the Grails application have ASP transformations associated with them. And uh, th this is an example of taking advantage of that feature offered by, uh, offered by Groovy. Uh, any questions or comments about any of that? Another notion that uh, Graph Wizard supports is a timer. And again, I'm quoting uh, how the Graph Wizard documentation uh, describes a timer. So a timer is a histogram uh, of the duration of a type of event and a meter of the rate at which it comes. So um, where a meter, uh, we can simplify a meter by just saying it's, it's sort of counting how many times something happens. A timer is, uh, is, is doing uh, some different things, right? A timer can tell you not only how, how often does something happen, but how long does it take to do that, to do that something. Uh, so here's some code that uh, one might use to, uh, uh, to take advantage of a, of a graph wizard timer. So we've still got to get a reference to the metric registry. We'll go to the register, we'll create a name for our timer, go to the registry to retrieve that timer. And then I, I uh, effectively I need to stop, start and stop the timer. So when I call timer.time, that kind of puts the timer in motion. And then at some point, I want to stop the timer. Uh, and we see that in the finally block. So all of your logic, whatever really is supposed to be going on in the sum action method, is all inside of the try block. And everything you see around that is uh, just a kind of a overhead. That, that's the cost of taking advantage of the graph wizard timer. It's not horrible, but uh, there's some code there. So just like the at metered annotation, there is an at timed annotation that behaves uh, the same way, right? So I can annotate a method with at time, uh, provide a timer name, and now at compile time, the plugin um, will, uh, will add all of the, the code that you see in the background to the method that's been annotated with, uh, with at time. Kind of more of the same thing. Does all make sense? Any questions about any of that stuff? set up here. I'm going to take a look at what uh, a little bit of the code that's in this uh, in this application. So I've got a controller called artist controller that is managing instances of this artist class. So the details of the domain classes are not particularly important, but I've got a domain class. An artist has albums associated with it, and I've got a, a RESTful controller here for interacting with instances of that, uh, that artist class. And notice that I've overridden the show method um, that is inherited from the RESTful controller class. And I've annotated that with, uh, with at meter. And the meter name is show artist. So I want to keep track of uh, how often the show artist, or I'm sorry, how often the show action in this controller is invoked. So I annotate the method with, uh, with at meter. Uh, separate from that, I've got the service called metrics logging service. Uh, so this is a Grail service, right? It's declared under Grails app for slab services. And what the service does is uh, it provides a method called log metric. And what the log metric 
method is doing is going and retrieving a meter from the network registry, grabbing the one minute view. Right? So what's the average number of times show artist, the show artist meter has been interacted with over the last minute? And if that rate is higher than some number, log a warning message. Otherwise, log an info message. So the, the logging here isn't the interesting bit. It just makes it easy to demonstrate what I want to talk about. The idea is uh, you could have logic inside of this log metrics method that does something if your application exceeds some threshold, right? So if your uh, so your application's up and running, and periodically you want to you want to sort of take a look at uh, the load of some particular part of your system. How often is the show action being executed in your controller? And if that rate exceeds some threshold that you get in time, then you can handle that however you like. Right? Maybe make a call out to some service that automatically spins up another instance of your app that now you're, you're uh, dynamically growing your, uh, your cluster. So you get to respond to that condition however you like. And you also get to define the condition. Right? So I've got a property called high volume threshold. And what I'm expressing there is if at any point the rate of requests that are coming into this uh, show action, if that, uh, if that point ever gets above 10 requests per second, then I want to do something about it. Right? So that, that's what's demonstrated here. And then I've also got setters and getters for, uh, in, in for setting that value and interrogating that value. So this uh, metrics uh, logger service has a property called high volume threshold, and I want to be able to set that threshold. And I'll talk about this managed resource and managed attribute notation in just a bit. Um, but so, 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 so far what we're concerned about is we've got a class that can inspect a particular meter and uh, uh, do something based on the condition of that meter. That, that's really all that's important so far. And then our, our last piece of this that I should introduce is there's a quartz job um, that I've configured in the, in the application. So quartz is a, a really sophisticated, really powerful um, job scheduling library. So if you want something to happen every three seconds or every Friday night or every day at noon, you've got lots of complexity around that or lots of um, flexibility around how you schedule jobs. Quartz makes that very, very easy to do. And we've got a quartz job, which makes it uh, even simpler to take advantage of what quartz has to offer. So here's a quartz job that I've set to trigger every three seconds. Uh, so that's syntax to the repeat interval colon 3000. Uh, that's what's expressed here. Every three seconds, I want this job to trigger. And what the job is doing is this, right? It's calling that method in the metrics logger service that, uh, that we just looked at. And that's what's resulting in the output that you see down here. I'm sure that font uh, down here is big enough you can see it, but it's, uh, it's outputting a, a rate of zero. Remember what we're, we're tracking is how often it is the show action in that controller being interacted with. And it's not being interacted with at all right now because uh, the rate is zero requests per second. All right. I'm going to start up a tool called uh, JMeter. How many of you are familiar with JMeter? Uh, most of you. That's good. JMeter is not a Grails tool. It's not a Groovy tool. It's just a, a, a written in Java. It's a tool. So one of the things you can do with JMeter is uh, uh, put an application under load. And uh, that's what I want to do. So I'm kind of in this test plan that I've got pre-created. I'm going to stop this app. I want to restart it just because I want the average to, to quickly get up. And it's been running for a while now, so it'll take all the, it'll, it'll take a while for the average to increase because that's all the time it's running. So I just stop the app. I'm restarting it. And then as soon as it starts up, I'm going to press play in JMeter, which is going to put this application under, uh, under load. So we'll start to see that, that meter increase. Application's running. I'm just doing meter operation in here. And after uh, two or three seconds, we can start to see that rate in the background. Here we go. So it's 0.12 requests per second, and that number will uh, will slowly start increasing. And our threshold right now is uh, is 10. So if that number gets above uh, 10 requests per second, then uh, we'll switch into the mode where we're logging a different message. So if I leave that running long enough, it'll, it'll get to that point. I'm going to leave it running, but uh, I'm going to introduce another idea while that's getting there. So right now, we're at about one request per second. Uh, so I mentioned.
mentioned earlier that uh, we get back to that managed resource and managed attribute annotation. So our metrics logger service is annotated with managed resource. And uh, the set high volume threshold and get high volume threshold methods are annotated with managed attribute. Uh, let's take a look at what that means. So we're up to five requests per second here. So I'm going to start up J console, which comes with uh, the JDK, and it's a mechanism for interacting with um, uh, uh, MDs that have been published using JMX. And in, a, in effect of having annotated this class with managed resource is an MD will be created and registered and these methods right here will be registered in that ending, or that ending will register these methods <coughs> as corresponding to attributes that we want to be able to manage through JMX. So let's see what that looks like over here in the J console. So if I look at our endings, I'm doing metrics demo, which is the name of our application. I see metrics logger service, right? And all I had to do to cause this ending to show up here is annotate that class with that managed attribute. And uh, so there's not a Rails 3-ism at play there. That's all coming from Spring Boot. Spring Boot makes it really, really easy to register endings, so we're, we're taking advantage of that. Uh, so here is the metrics logger service uh, ending, and if I were to look at the attributes that the thing has to offer, uh, the high volume threshold is showing up here, and we see it has a value of 10. If I look down here under operations, there's an operation called set high volume threshold, and there's an operation called get high volume threshold. If I were to call get high volume threshold, we see the value is 10. Right? Let's go back and look at uh, the state of our application right now. So we're up to, so we're above 10 now. So look right there, you see the crossover. Uh, and if the font was too small to read up here, you can at least see that the, the lines are longer now. That's because we're seeing a different, different message. This says high volume, because if we've crossed over that threshold, uh, where before we were simply logging rate, that's, that, that's this business right here, right? So if the rate is above 10, log a warning if there's high volume, and if otherwise, log rate. So right there is when we, we crossed over and went into the red. So now we want to spin up another instance or do whatever it is that makes sense for our application to respond to that message. I've got that ending set up so we can, our, we can dynamically interact with our application while it's running to not only uh, interrogate and discover details about, uh, about that threshold, but we get to control it, right? So we're up to 11 requests per second we're seeing in the background, and uh, our operations people have been notified, and, and they decide, okay, everything's cool. Uh, the right thing to do is just to change the threshold right now. So I'll turn the threshold up to uh, 15. That should send us back into normal operation, operating mode, and it did. You see the logging message just changed. And wh while that demo seems, uh, seems trivial and maybe not particularly interesting because all we're doing is logging messages, uh, really the, the possibilities associated with all of that are, uh, are really quite powerful, right? With very, very little effort in, from the application developer's perspective, we've accomplished a number of interesting things. One, one is that in a very simple way, we've uh, introduced uh, a really sophisticated, we've introduced access to a really sophisticated metering mechanism. We've simply annotated that method with that meter, and now we get all kinds of uh, uh, good drop wizard capabilities associated with this class. Another is that it's, uh, it's very easy for us to write something that can react to conditions associated with that meter, right? So I've got a push job that's calling into this service every three seconds. And this service is interrogating that meter, looking for some condition, and uh, we're just logging a warning versus logging info. But uh, as we said, for this line right here, instead of logging that, or maybe in addition to logging that, we could be making calls to our operation center, making rep calls to our operation center, doing what we can respond to that however, however we want. Maybe we don't have to have any communication with some ex any external service, but maybe instead, what would happen here is the application would go into some other state, right? So maybe there's some capability in our application that can be at, at runtime be turned on or off. We've got, we've, we've crossed this threshold, so now we'll set the flag to turn something off. So well, the point is we get to respond to those, uh, uh, these conditions however is appropriate for this app. And then the last piece is 
uh, what it took to expose access to that high volume threshold over JMS is uh, really, really simple, right? All I had to do was initiate the class with managed resource and uh, uh, optionally initiate uh, these uh, message with uh, managed attributes. And now I can interact with that thing as an MD without really writing any JMX code, without writing any drop wizard code, without writing any course code. Uh, we're taking advantage of all of those libraries and uh, uh, we've got lots of interesting capabilities that we're trying to do there. All that make sense? So as I said, the, the sample that I'm, that I'm demonstrating here is, is trivial. All we're doing is uh, putting the thing under the load and logging different messages. But uh, hopefully it's easy to kind of see the possibilities and how simple it was to get access to, uh, to those messages. Thoughts or comments or concerns about any of that stuff? You said, may we have a quick look at the test plan for what? What? Oh, the test plan for JMeter, yeah, yeah. Uh, so what the JMeter uh, test plan is doing is I've got a loop controller here. Uh, let's see, here's our simple controller. What the simple controller is doing, oh, it's easy to make that, it's right here. We're sending a request to, and I don't know how many messages are there. I'm trying to see if I count that many, whoops. Right, we're sending a request there um, to slash artist slash artist counter. And this artist counter is this variable that, uh, this counter that I've set up in the test plan that goes from one to 49. Um, so for some uh, reasons that, that relate to some development work that I'm uh, uh, doing with the plugin, I wanted to not send the same request over and over again. There was some caching going on. What I wanted to do was uh, recruit a different artist you know, so uh, I could screw around some, some caching issues. I really did want to make sure some of these queries were being executed. So I've got an artist counter here that uh, goes from 1 to 49. There's some code in the bootstrap of this. Uh, uh, where is it? Where is it? Right there. That's creating 50 artists. I've got a loop here that's creating 50 artists. So uh, uh, 1 to 49. Uh, actually, probably 1 to 50 would work. But uh, So there are that many artists out there. And what this test plan is doing is using this counter to go from 1 to 49 and send a request that, so I'm recruiting different artists each time, and I've got, uh, let's see, there's another piece of this, there is, yeah, maybe that's uh, not in this version, that's in this other stuff. But that's really all the test plan is doing, is uh, doing this over and over again, slash artist slash one, slash artist slash two, all the way up to 49 now. And I can tweak this, I can do something like, uh, if I change this number, let's see where we're at right now. So it looks like the thing is leveled off at about 11.5 requests per second. So let's stop the, the plan here and let's cut this tweet from 3,000 to 1,500 and start it up again. So that should increase our uh, request per second. So we had leveled off at about 11.5. It's going to drop here for a minute just because I stopped the JMeter uh, momentarily and it should start increasing and we're already, we're back up to 11.9, up to 12. So JMeter is just really, really super slick stuff. Makes it very easy to create uh, great load for your application. There's lots of flexibility in JMeter. Uh, just, uh, I used it in this demonstration just because it's a simple way of creating loads and things. How many of you use JMeter in your day-to-day -day life? So I'm no uh, JMeter expert. Uh, I sort of fumbled around with some Linux stuff here once in a while and now I can really say that that uh, works for what I'm using. Other questions or comments about any of that? Yeah. Uh, is it easy to aggregate meters across instances? So that's, uh, that's really what's going on here, right? So the controller happens to be a singleton, but it wouldn't have to be. If it weren't a singleton, this would still work. What's happening every time this method is invoked, so, so imagine that the controller is not a singleton, there are, there are 30 of them and they're all being interacted with. So, so we're calling the show method on all these different instances. Yeah, so I, I, yeah, I think the, the question is, is it, uh, what does it take to aggregate uh, meters not across instances of this class, but across processes, right? And I don't know the answer to that. I, 
one where a drop wizard has some sort of uh, uh, mechanism to support that or not. Um, there's nothing in the, the current version of the drop wizard metric plugin that contributes to that at all. So it could be the case that drop wizard has some support for that. Um, just haven't gotten to it yet. Uh, but I, I don't know the answer to that. Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, can I use this to keep track of how long something is taking? Um, and a meter won't help you with that, but a timer will, right? So a timer um, keeps track of how long, how long it takes to do something. So this particular timer, which I'm going to see here, would tell us how much time is being spent, um, really it's telling us how much time is being spent in this pry block. Um, but the overhead around it is, is probably going to be uh, uh, noise. So effectively what I'm doing is keeping track of how much time is spent in the timer. So a timer will do that, uh, that's not what a meter will do. A meter uh, helps you keep track of something like uh, request per second. A timer helps you keep track of how much time is being spent in this clock. So, and they get uh, aggregated, right? So it's not how much time was spent on this particular invocation. When I retrieve that timer from the, um, uh, from the metric registry, I can discover, um, I'm not looking at details about a particular invocation of this metric. I'm saying how much time is being spent in this metric. So if there's been a million occurrences of following this metric in the last uh, uh, whatever time period, I, I, can, I can know how much time was spent. That's the average time, and uh, I think I can, I can say there's a million there, and a million, I can discover details about how much time is being spent. So I think what you're asking about uh, is uh, a timer is, is good for that, uh, but a meter is not. Is there another hand over here? Any other comments or questions about any of that? Thoughts? Seem simple, seem complicated. Simple. Like many things in life. Yes. So uh, the question is, uh, uh, so I've demonstrated how to programmatically get access to some of this data. Is there a, a good mechanism or is there a mechanism to get kind of an overview of the whole picture of what's going on? And uh, so I, maybe I owe you, uh, owe you a beer now for bringing that up because that's a, that's a fantastic question. Uh, yeah. So another, another interesting component here is a thing that we've got in the works um, at OCI that uh, hopefully we're a small number of months away from being able to, uh, to share a lot more details about. But we're working on a product called, uh, that we're calling Continuity. And Continuity is, uh, is going to be a, a dashboard and management console that uh, provides all kinds of compelling stuff from, um, uh, for a lot of folks from a DevOps perspective. So you'll, you'll be able to, to manage, uh, to monitor and manage not only details like um, how long, how much time is being spent in a particular metric, that's one of the things you can look at, but it's, uh, it's really uh, addressing a much broader scope where you can monitor the, the, whole, the whole environment. So you can see things like um, how long are your deployments taking? And when deployments fail, when a deployment fails, let's say you've got a continuous deployment situation set up, when a deployment fails, uh, which commits are the commits that are different from that deployment to the previous one? You'll be able to, to backtrack and find out what kinds of things are problematic. You'll be able to monitor uh, health of applications, including details like uh, metrics and time we've been talking about now. So the product is called uh, Continuity. Uh, there's not much information. It's not that it's secret, but we just haven't published a, a lot of information about it yet. Um, uh, in uh, coming months, uh, hopefully we're going to be able to, to start, uh, start sharing a lot more details around that. If that kind of thing sounds interesting to you, uh, let me know, send me an email, or, or contact me here uh, this week, and we'll be happy to set up uh, a demo or conference call with you and talk about
about that or uh, sort of smaller grain details like the rail specific stuff. But look to hear more about continuity from the CI uh, over these years. It's been really compelling and interesting stuff. So I think the question is, uh, can we use these uh, capabilities that I'm talking about to monitor, uh, to meter or time uh, events? Is that correct? In an event-based system? Yeah, so your events are causing something to happen. Uh, you've got an event, uh, say you've got an event handler, and events come in, and that event handler is dispatching calls to other things, right? Um, so you can be metering the event handler. You can be in, uh, metering the things that the event handler is interacting with. Uh, as far as uh, the graph wizard stuff is concerned, the fact that you're doing, that you've got an event driven system doesn't really factor in there. It, what uh, we're enabling you to do is monitor and uh, gather metrics around uh, blocks of code. And if those blocks of code happen to be triggered by events, then that's fine. But uh, I don't think events uh, factor in in any particular interesting way. If you've got ideas for interesting ways to uh, sort of hook into or, or um, Things that the plugin could do that are particularly compelling for an event-based system, I would uh, welcome that input. Do you, do you have something specific in mind right now? So, so you could definitely do that sort of thing, right? You could use something like, uh, like this example here is uh, tracking how often uh, a particular meter is implemented. So your event handler is calling something. Uh, you could be metering that, having something monitor that meter, and that something can respond in the way you just described, right? So you recognize that, that this particular event is showing up uh, 400 times per second, and uh, that uh, the system is currently operating in a mode where that's uh, stressing things, so let's start up another one increase uh, connection score, whatever it is you want to get to respond to that more than once. Is that making sense? Yeah, so I don't think, uh, what, uh, one thing that, that probably, I'd have to give some thought, but I, I don't think, uh, something I don't think will end up being a function of the plugin is uh, the doing things like uh, scaling things out and growing connection pools. That would be a piece that would take advantage of this, but, but separate from this. At least that's how I, I'm thinking about it right now. Does that make sense? Other questions or comments? Anything at all Grails 3 related or Grails related, anything at all that I can help you with, uh, please uh, track me down. I'll be here, uh, of course, all day today and again tomorrow. Uh, thanks to the great folks for, uh, for having us out again, and uh, thank you all very much.